Okay, thanks everybody for joining. And uh, today it's a remote meeting. And uh, as uh, we do with remote meetings, I have a just a public uh, uh, statement on that. So uh, <clears throat> this open meeting of the Hopkinton Appropriation Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order on, of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of the emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of, of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed to and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. For this meeting, the Appropriation Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom webinar as posted on the town's web meeting calendar and the board's agenda identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are, are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting business ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct for our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in dialogue with other members, please do, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Not every agenda item will feature public comment. For the public forum portion of the agenda, the chair will work with the meeting host a call on each pre-registered speaker to make their comment. Each speaker must begin by identifying their name and address. Each speaker will have up to three minutes for their comments. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by vote by roll call. All right, thank you. All right, so on today's agenda, we have, uh, if there's any public comment, uh, that'll be first on the agenda. And then we're gonna have the uh, discuss the first fiscal year 22 budget proposals for the library, health services, youth and family services, and senior center departments. Next, we'll review questions from the previous budget sessions. Then we will review changes to estimated re revenue or expenses, and then review a planning for appropriation committee report. Okay, I think any other questions? So, Chris, is there anyone from the public looking to uh, have any public comment today? I do not see anyone else, no. Okay, so we're ready for the first item on the agenda. And I welcome uh, the various uh, departments from for appearing today. And I think we're gonna start uh, today with the, uh, the library. So Heather Bachman, um, I think you're first. Right. And, uh, and, but uh, let's see what, we find has been successful if you just want to give an overview of your operational, you know, of your budget and then uh, go from there. Sure. Um, our budget for FY22 as recommended is fairly straightforward. Um, it maintains service at pre-pandemic levels without any enhancements. The overall budget meets uh, the state's minimum appropriation requirement for certification, and it will require the library to spend about $54,000 from non-town sources to meet the state's materials expenditure requirement for certification. Um, just a reminder, certification is what enables a uh, Hopkinton resident to go to any other library in the Commonwealth and get a card and check out materials. And it's also what makes us eligible to receive state aid. Um, so the town appropriations fund three uh, primary buckets for our expenditures, staff and collections and office supplies. 
uh, as well as a few hundred dollars for professional development annually. And any other expense that we have, so library events, our membership in our consortium, which is about $20,000 a year, most of our collection spending, additional professional development, extra technology, that is all funded through non-tax sources. Our Heather, Heather, before you go on, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Tim, do you can you share the the but put the budget on the screen so we can follow along? I guess like we did last time. Uh, if you can get, I I'll, can maybe do it. It's on the January. It's on page five of enclosure four of the January 26 budget memo that I sent to everybody. Uh, and I can try to find that on my device I'm using, and try to share it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, Heather, why don't you continue? And then if Tim can bring it, you just share it and we'll see it. And those who have it, they can just bring it up on their own too. So sorry for the interruption. I just thought it, it, it's helpful. No, vigil aids are helpful. And, and I'll just say <laughs> that that, that non-tax spending that is, I referenced is not um, reflected in the, the budget on the town manager side because that's all handled through other sources and appropriations. Um, so um, in FY22, our recommended budget is 6% higher than FY21. This translates to an increase of 1.3% when we adjust for the fact that in early 2020, some staff members' pay rates were adjusted so that they aligned with new ranges in the town's pay classification plan. So um, basically we had a, a situation where the town implemented new ranges and we had some staff members who were below the minimum levels of those new ranges and those staff members pay rates were adjusted to, to meet that level. Um, so increases in our FY22 budget are entirely due to increased rates for current staff. And that's the result of that adjustment to bring some staff up to minimum of new pay ranges um, from state minimum wage hikes and from annual raises. All of our other budget lines have been kept level or decreased. Uh, the budget reflects our current staffing levels, which is six full-time and 10 regularly scheduled part-time positions, including our current vacancies. It does not include any new positions. And some of the increases are offset by savings in other areas, which include anticipated savings on new hires, eliminating extra children's room staffing in the summer, thanks to efficiencies created by new summer reading software, and reducing our office supplies line. And that's, that's it. We're pretty simple this year. No, no big asks this year. Okay, uh, any questions? Thank you. Start with uh, Shahadul, do you have any questions? Um, thank you, Mike. And thank you, Heather. I think it's uh, simple enough and uh, seems uh, pretty straightforward. I just had some uh, general questions. I think library is doing a wonderful job with your staff, so thank you to you all. And uh, there's a lot of interest, especially during the COVID period. It has been a great source for many, uh, I think, recreation and book reading, uh, enhancing uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, pastime entertainment in some ways. So I appreciate that. I was wondering for, um, in general, what is the state of things with the library membership? How many members do you have? And do you see year-to-year -year progress? And do you anticipate uh, that impacting your overall support system, including staffing? Sure. Um, I can pull up our actual annual report so that I don't have, I don't misquote this number off the top of my head. Um, and I pulled up the wrong document. I believe it's, we have about, there we go. Uh, in 2020, we had 10,600 card holders as of end of the year. So that's a, a significant fraction of the town. I think it's about, um, 60%-ish, which is reasonably good. Certainly our level of use impacts the demand on the staff. Um, and we do find that our current staffing level is strained to provide the level of services that the town wants for, especially since post after the building renovation, our use levels went way up. Um, so we are literally in the next couple of weeks about to launch a new strategic plan with the public and um, one thing that we're going to be doing in FY22 under that new plan will be to create a staffing plan uh, that will kind of lay out what it is that we think we need in terms of personnel to really achieve what the town is asking us to achieve. And you will almost certainly be seeing some asks for us in FY23 and beyond um, in accordance with that staffing plan 
to help make sure that we have the personnel resources in place to support town interests and needs. Thank you, right? that makes sense. And uh, certainly library plays a huge role in education overall, right, for our community and especially for the younger um, community, younger part of the community. Now, along those lines, um, uh, I would look forward to, you know, the, your strategic plan and the uh, additional, um, you know, support or ask uh, and how the town can um, uh, afford that or accommodate that. On those lines, are you also thinking of, you know, your overall systems, electronic services, software and others, uh, because that, as we all know, and you want for sure know that uh, plays a huge role in the current education system and the library system, of course. Absolutely. So from a, just a basic infrastructure perspective, we're very fortunate to have a fantastic IT department in town that supports us. Um, our cataloging service and actually our eBooks system, we get through our CW Mars Consortium, which is $20,000 a year for membership. And we get a lot of value out of that. Um, we are looking at, again, from our strategic plan for some potential FY22 action items. We haven't pinned down everything exactly yet, but um, certainly some additional electronic resources are on the table. You know, we've heard people asking for more of that, um, as well as some potential um, library of things, which might include technological items, uh, as well as other things. It's all, we're very much, I'm literally talking to our um, our affiliate fundraising groups next week to see what they might be interested in supporting because those are the kinds of things that we don't have any money from the town to support we do find other ways to um, make those available to the community thank you that's very helpful and one last item on that front is that what are the current or any potential revenue sources even you know that is not the of course main focus of the library uh, that you might have or you might be looking at if you can help us um, get sure. some thoughts there. We bring in about $2,000 annually in printing fees, which goes straight to the town general fund. It does not go into the library budget. Um, we have brought in some money through uh, overdue fines and through lost materials and, and materials replacements fines. We did, uh, the trustees have voted to eliminate overdue fines on library materials as an equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative to make sure that we are accessible to all and we aren't putting up a financial barrier to our neediest citizens. Um, that is about seven to $8,000 a year, which we are going to absorb through our state aid. Um, so we, there's no additional request to the town for materials funding this year based on that. Um, and we will continue to charge fees for lost and damaged materials. So things that we're actually having to buy again to replace things, we're still getting money to help us support the cost of those replacements. Um, beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm philosophically very cautious about money for library services. The state does require that we provide basic services <clears throat> as a condition of being certified. Um, and again, when you get to that kind of equity and inclusion angle that we're very, um, very invested in, um, every fine, every fee is a barrier. And uh, when we are an institution where full participation is really crucial for a functioning democratic society, free access to information is really crucial. Um, my feeling is I would rather seek revenue sources, you know, through things like town appropriations, grants, and our fundraising affiliates. And we are very fortunate to have uh, the Friends and Foundation, um, who are two separate groups who fundraise for us. They have been challenged in the last year, along with many nonprofits. Their major fundraising sources were um, based on physical in-person events. And so they are reworking their plans. Um, and the Friends have actually recently done an, an appeal for, for some help so that they continue to purchase our adventure passes which get discounted admission to museums. And they've been very successful with that from what I've heard, which has been fantastic. Um, we're also you know, hoping to start looking at some grant applications in the next year or so. And I know that um, Mr. Sweeney is looking for a, a position in his office to help with grant applications. And I throw my support behind that wholeheartedly. Um, when he was in that position, it was really helpful to us. Uh, again, getting back to that staffing level, it's hard to find the time to apply for grants as important as it is and having support from the town on that um, while Ben was was launching that position was so helpful. 
So um, that's that's kind of my thinking. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm glad that you have so much focus on diversity and equity and of course the core mission of the library. And I couldn't agree more that uh, fines and penalty are the last thing uh, and it's counterintuitive in many ways uh, with the mission of the library. And I'm glad about the partnership. I, I, I'm, I think that's the right thinking in terms of grants and uh, also throwing it out there is partnership with educational institutes potentially, um, you know, and at, at state level or at various private uh, sector level that can certainly enhance the cause. Uh, but that's all uh, I think good for them. Thank you. Thank you. Ahadul, um, Wayne, do you have any questions? Sure. Well, so I saw that budget flash by, and it looks like the library salary is up six seven per six point seven percent. Expenses are down one one. Just, I mean, given I assume the, the library use was was severely decreased recently. Um, assuming folks come back, also the expansion of the town. Do we think that um, you know, is level expense uh, realistic, or is it you know? I, 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 it just, it just seems counterintuitive to me that that expenses would be level, understanding that um, you know there's not a lot of wiggle room in the personal services. Sure. You... I, I, I want to be clear as I answer your question. Are you asking why are we not asking for more or why are we not asking for less? So as a finance guy, controller, I hate saying, why aren't you asking for more, but why aren't you asking for more? I guess, yes, that, that's kind um, of what I'm, and I'm, I just you know want to make sure that the underlying assumptions are realistic, I guess, for lack of a better word. Absolutely. And I, I thank you for asking me that because that's a question that I love to be asked and I love to hear if the <laughs> are disappointed I'm not asking for more. Um, this year, it was kind of a pause year. So we did, um, we, we got a rather large budget bump in the last few years to bring on additional staff uh, to expand hours. So in the last three years, we started operating on Saturdays in the summer. We added about eight hours of operating time during the week, and we had literally just hired staff. I'm saying literally a lot tonight. I'm sorry. Late in the week. Um, we had just hired staff to enable us to add Sunday afternoons when the pandemic hit. Okay. Um, so that's been our focus, and, and our focus as we come out of the pandemic is really on continuing to integrate those staff, getting back to full hours, expanding to those Sunday afternoons. We actually have about 15% of our staffing right now is vacant due to people leaving for other reasons through the last year. Um, so our focus, you know, we're just working on hiring up to where we were to support full services as soon as we can get things out of the hiring freeze. Um, but again, that staffing plan, you know, this was kind of a year of planning. Next year will be a year of more specific planning based on what came out of our strategic plan. And that staffing plan is gonna be asking for some, some um, increases. Uh, if you were at the all hands meeting mm -hmm. last night, I think the, the number that was attached to our ask was 175,000. And I'll be honest, that was me trying to make a relatively conservative estimate in terms of number of FTEs that I'd like to have. I would like to have more than that, but I want to be respectful of the town's, you know, budgetary situation and tax situation. Um, so stay tuned. Next year, you'll probably hear something a little bit different from me. Okay. So for this year, you're confident that you're well positioned. That's, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if I can just chime in, because my, Bill, I'll go get to you, but I wanted to my topic or my question was about the same, but when Wayne, you're saying, why weren't we asking more? Um, but the budget, the current budget did not go down, even though you, you didn't spend it all, but the, from a budget perspective, it didn't go down with our current budget. So right. it's, it's consistent. So, um, which is unusual so, to see any budget not increase. So, which is but then as Heather was saying that a lot of the, the budget mm -hmm. we didn't you didn't use it all because you didn't have the staffing and for other if people left but the budget doesn't change it's 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 got a baked in return return to normality or whatever our normality will be right yep and Good. heather might correct on that is, is that the correct, correct. Assumption? yeah so so this budget carries um you know i think we're going to be under our expenditures on staff by about 10 percent this this year because of the vacancies we have we've had to bring in substitutes and add hours for other staff a little bit to cover hours so that we could be open as much as we are, but we're saving a lot of money this year on people who aren't, aren't in positions. Um, 
And, and I actually, I, I should have given you a slightly more complete answer too, Wayne, because we are looking at some new starts, new additions. And, and again, we're looking at that through non-town sources. So next week, I'm going to be going to our friends and foundation and saying, here's a whole bunch of things that we're looking at for FY22. What can you support? Um, and that's costs ranging from things that are a few hundred dollars up to tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so we're, we're looking at those increases, just not from the town. Um, not this year. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, thank you, Wayne. Bill, do you have any questions? Well, uh, I had two, one on revenue and one on budget. They've both been asked and answered. So other than that, uh, just thank you for your time and sharing the information with us. Sure, thank you. Right. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, the one question I did have, I, I'm not sure if you answered it, but for the 6% increase, is that increase, is that mostly contractual? Is there an added position in there or uh, why 6%? So that's no, no new uh, positions. What happened is um, sometime in the last 12 to 18 months, somebody else can maybe give me the exact timeline on this. The town implemented a new um, pay, pay rate, pay schedule for miscellaneous, what we call miscellaneous employees, which is uh, part-time employees. Um, at the time that was implemented because uh, the library, the town and the staff were in union negotiations, staff were not brought onto that pay plan. Uh, about a year ago, we signed a side letter with the union pending, you know, as the full negotiations were going on, we wanted to get staff some increases because I felt that was fair. So we signed an agreement, uh, negotiated with them that staff would be brought up to the minimum of new town pay increases. And that is the vast majority of that 6% increase. We had some people who were being paid significantly less than what the town determined those new ranges should be. Um, particularly in our, our professional side, um, we had not kept up with, with what the field is paying overall. So. Okay. So, so is that, specifically for ne in next year's budget. I know in a, we talked to one of the, was it the fire chief or police chief where they had a, they owed back pay or they were going into previous. So this is just, everything's current and this is just moving forward. Everything's current. Um, the, if the, if the contract is negotiated by town meeting, then I, my understanding is that at town meeting, the town would vote on any additional cost that would come into play as a result of the new contract. Um, but that that isn't reflected here because we don't know what that is yet. But that that's what would be a separate vote. This is no back pay. We don't owe any back pay. Okay. We're off to speed. All right. Yeah. That, that's all I have. All right. Unless anyone has any other questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate the time. And I just want to also recognize my trustees who came to to see the meeting as well and say thank you for your uh, appearance tonight. Thanks, thank you. All right, thank you, Heather. All right, next uh, we have uh, health services. So Sean has not joined us yet, so I suggest we skip ahead. We're trying to get in touch with him. All right, so next would be uh, youth and family services. And I take it it's uh, Don, Don Miller, Don Alcott Miller? Yes, Don Alcott Miller. So I'll start with um, our, our personal services. I'll go with the big ask first. <laughs> um, we, um, this year during COVID, also did our strategic plan. And through doing our strategic plan, um, you know, and, and looking at the impact of COVID on mental health and looking at what we knew the truth was about mental health prior to COVID, um, we decided to move forward with our big ask of adding another staff person. And this staff person um, would be a program coordinator slash clinician um, who would have flexibility because they'd be a licensed clinician, they would have flexibility to flex as the times flex. Right now, um, the need is so great <laughs> for mental health, as you know. <laughs> Um, you know, you turn on any TV and those are the buzzwords. That was true before with anxiety and depression in young people that had been on the rise prior to a pandemic. And so um, this person could flex. This person could help us in the programming, um, 
in the prevention piece so that we shore up people's resiliency right now or you know then <laughs> at the beginning of the new year um and that we can be more responsive to the mental health needs that we know are coming. Um, we have like two major things that we do. We prevent and we respond. And, um, and our response has been intense over um, the last year. So the bulk of what you see there and that 48.2% increase um, is for another position, which roughly comes to 63,400. Um, and, and the, and, the the remaining is is just um, the the adjustments to salaries um, that you see there, and then in our expenses, which cover our mileage and our programming, um, and um, you know our expenses, you know, supplies, basic things, um, that drops ten thousand dollars because last year we asked for a bump up. Um, because we knew earmarks were going away. Uh, we knew that we were losing a lot, a lot of the um, support that we did have. And we, um, with that money, have been working with a trainer and consultant for Hopkinton Organizing for Prevention so that we can apply this spring for the Drug-Free Communities Grant and hopefully secure that grant um, to, um, which is, it's a big one. And so, and our consultant hasn't failed yet in any of her applications. So we're hopeful, <laughs> but as you know, with grants, things could go any way. Um, so, so for that, the, the return on our investment could be great, um, but we don't need it. Well, we, we won't need it next year. Um, we can get by with the programming we have and through other grant writing and finding um, other funds for our programming um, through grants. Um, so that we could return that 10,000 out of our budget and, and go back to what we had before. So otherwise that would be level to what, what we had the prior year. And so, you know, I don't know what questions you have about our department, I'm happy to answer anything. All right, uh, start with Wayne, do you have any questions? Sure, I guess just, just I guess, how are staffing levels established for the group? Are there metrics by, by town population, by? So right now we're staffed with me as a director and a three quarter okay. um, social worker, Colleen Souza. And the towns around us, we did do a lot of investigation around that. And um, like towns of 12,000 have two full-time staff, um, towns, even less than, you know, south, over in Southborough, right over the line, they have a far less in size. They have a program coordinator, they have clerical staff, they have uh, several clinicians, you know, so we, we look at that and, and we know that we're behind for the size of the population and, and the needs in the population. Um, there's been a lot that's happened here around diversity and around, um, and we were really proud this year to start a support group that we'd like to continue um, for BIPOC youth. And we utilized an intern to help us get that going. Um, but to continue these programs, it takes staff and we're so busy responding. We want to be able to continue to offer the programming um, and to bolster that programming and to offer more and more rich opportunities for people and their mental health and their behavioral health. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks Wayne. All right, Bill, do you have any questions? Sure. Um, you mentioned the majority of that, the increase was for an additional staff member, I think at around 63,000. I don't have the number in front of me, but if you were to back that out, what would the remaining increase be? That's just staff, the, the pay increase from one year to the next. But 5%, um, is, is there a, a number? I'm just curious what that would end up being. I don't know. I think that was... 2.5%. Okay. All right. And the other question, uh, which should have asked Chief Bennett maybe last week, with all the talk about using health and human services folks with and, you know, and with the police department, is that something we're doing in, in this town? And do they use your resources or will they intend to have their own? Or can you help me understand that a little bit better? That's that's a great question, and and we do both. So um, the the police, and I hope I don't misspeak, but they're very fortunate to contract with advocates for two days a week. They have a ride along clinician through the um, 
jail diversion program. And, and she works from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And, and that's that's two days a week. And she can be flexible. She's, she's shared with other communities in the area. And so she can be flexible sometimes if there's a need for her to like flop back over into Hopkinton. Um, but they utilize us quite a bit and the, the police department does. And, and we do collaborate with Ashley, their jail diversion clinician as well. Um, but um, I would say on the, a pretty like a weekly basis, we're communicating either our direction or they're communicating back to us. I just was on with Chief Bennett last night around domestic violence and making sure that um, the resources we were posting were accurate um, about about that. In, in the week before, we were we were reaching out to the court officer because we had a young person with a court case that we wanted to make sure was was secure and that we had figured things out correctly. So um, we collaborate. Um, frequently, the, the officers do reach out to us and let us know about people with needs in the community and make several referrals. Okay, thanks for educating me on that. Sure. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Shahadul. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you and your staff for a wonderful service. I think it's very much a very critical, especially in times like this, and couldn't agree more that uh, this is so important for our social fabric the health of uh, people's minds. And uh, I wanted to also look at uh, kind of understanding uh, if you can give a brief overview of your service framework, how it operates, who are the partners, what are the touch points? So what I'll do is share with you the presentation I did for the select board, if that's okay. It's, it's under three minutes. <laughs> so, um, so our mission is to provide access to comprehensive social services for youth and families and to enhance behavioral health for the entire Hopkinton community. Our vision is that Hopkinton will be a town in which all people are valued, where behavioral health is a high priority and residents have a place to turn when they need help. Our strategic goals that came out of our strategic plan are to help to strengthen and clarify the network of services that acts as a safety net for vulnerable residents provide primary prevention services to build a healthy community culture, increase- Sorry, Don. Sorry to interrupt. Are you sharing something or would you want to? Um, okay. I, what's that? No, are you sharing? You mentioned a slide. Uh, are you sharing oh, no. something? No, I oh. wasn't sharing. I was just going to, to read the presentation. Oh, okay. okay, just making sure. Okay. Yeah. I, no I could though. <laughs> I do have a strategic plan presentation right keyed up, but, but I don't know that you want that right now. <laughs> um, but you can come if you want to know more. I would love to have you on Monday. We have two presentations on Monday um, that we're giving to the public around our strategic plan. But um, And we, we hope to increase community awareness of behavioral health issues, our mission and services and how to access help, and develop efficient and effective funding, staffing, and processes. Um, what does all this mean? How does this translate into what we do and what does it look like in real time? It's helping the single grandmother facing eviction who works a demanding job, even though she's raising her granddaughter and is very sick herself and juggling her granddaughter's serious mental health needs. It's consulting with and supporting the parents whose child just returned from the emergency room after becoming violent and out of control during the pandemic a child who should have been hospitalized or had access to a program because of their needs, but for whom no openings are available during this challenging time. The child who can't attend online therapy programs because they really need a clinician with skin and not a video screen. It's supporting the middle schooler who just can't stand the sight of themselves on constant Zoom calls, who can't escape the discomfort of a time of life where they wonder who they are, who they want to become with no place to hide and no place to retreat, always feeling in full view. It's supporting the high school student who never got enough before. And now seems to that seems to be the norm. And due to the pandemic feels overwhelmed with school, the isolation they feel and the losses they've experienced. It's starting Just Youth, a support group for youth who have been mocked, teased, bullied and marginalized due to their ethnicity or the color of their skin a support group for whom many will say has been a lifeline during these challenging times. It's collaborating with partners and old friends 
Mommying is Hard, South Asian Circle of Hopkinton, Mental Health Collaborative, and the Freedom Team to bring relevant and professional programming to residents, employees, and town organizations. So that's our overview of our department. And um, that kind of explains, you know, right down to the micro, how, how we do what we do um, and, and why we do what we do. Thank you. I think that's very helpful and educational. I appreciate that. Uh, now, uh, given that, few other questions, follow-ups. One is that, uh, do you have uh, two things? One is um, health check based on, you know, the data that you have, or maybe the cases that you have gone through over years about our town that could help us, you know, kind of reflect on that. And I, I think it may be part of your strategic plan as well. And then second, any comparison that you were mentioning with the other towns as to, you know, with the population or with, you know, certain specific metrics around focus on special areas of mental health uh, that could give us a, a kind of understanding of where we stand uh, as a town overall, and then where we stand in terms of servi servicing and uh, uh, addressing those for now and for long-term compared to other towns. Sure. It's so, loaded, whatever you may have. So for, the, for the statistics around mental health, um, the ones that pop into my mind are that roughly, and you know, it's all in the strategic plan presentation and that the whole strategic plan is available to you online. And it's, you know, I can get it to the appropriations committee as well. Um, I might be able, at, when we're done talking, to drop it into the chat as well, so you'll have it. Um, but the, the number that stood out to me even before COVID-19 is that 12% of high school students were thinking about suicide. Um, that's kind of mind blowing, you know, like, and that is a good number in comparison to other communities around us. Like Westboro had 16% on that, not to call them out, but you know, we're doing a lot right in Hopkinton is what I'm saying. And yet, even with doing a lot right and, and with parents that are so devoted to their kids and with, you know, a great school system, all of those things, these are the times we're in. And, and those numbers have only served to increase nationwide. We don't have the metrics of what's going on in kids' heads right now. Um, the test, uh, the survey wasn't given this year due to COVID. It will be given next year. So we'll have more data on whether that's increased, stayed the same or gone down, but we expect it will increase based on na national numbers. Um, and then in the adult population, um, roughly there was, there was a, a number around 50% felt like too embarrassed to ask for help about stigma. So we'd like to do a lot of work around stigma reduction. And, um, and and that was around seeking care and, and letting people know they needed care. Um, so there's work to be done there, even in the parents, you know, and, and the folks that took that survey were middle-aged. And so we, we know that in our middle-aged population, there's, there's big suicide risk there as well. And that's growing for women and it's the leading numbers for men. And so, um, you know, we have concerns there that, that folks are too afraid to ask for help when they need it. And then in youth, um, there were, there were three different metrics um, around anxiety, depression, and um, I'm trying to remember the third, but they were at 33%. It was like a third of kids feeling these things. So it's all definitely packed into the strategic plan. And then in terms of town comparisons, I do have that buried in my Google Drive. Um, and I'd be happy to you know give you a link to that um, before the night's over. But, I, we, but um, I have spent a lot of time in speaking with other departments like ours. Um, none are exactly the same as each other. And, and what I recognized right away is that, that we're short staffed for the population that we have. Um, Thank you. I would like to have all the good information that you just gave. That's, uh, sure. I think, um, informative, but at the same time concerning and horrifying to some extent too, uh, with the trend and everything that's going on. So with all that, uh, two things, I'll go to the finance part, but before I do that, um, what is your plan uh, anticipating, you know, with the COVID impact, especially on school kids and even, you know, uh, uh, the early school kids, my, my daughter is in the sixth grade and she's been at home for one year doing Zoom classes, right? I certainly have a 
impact on um, kids' mental health. So there are you know various levels of um, support that the kids and the community might need. Uh, do you have any um, plans or you know thoughts laid out or in the process to kind of help um, ramping up on that path, the community to normalcy? It's a tough one because, you know, right now I feel like we're responding a lot. It's hard to be innovative where when your 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 time is spent responding and responding. But we are, you know, we're create we're we're creative. And um one of the things that we've learned is that um BIPOC middle school youth are asking for support group as well. So that's on our agenda, that's on our plans to to offer a support group. Um, for children of color um, in the middle school because the high school group was very successful and siblings heard about it and want it for themselves. <laughs> um, and then kids we met with um, at the middle school during um, following, they, they have like a mental health assessment that they do and following that mental health assessment that was identified over and over again as a need. Um, and then we have a mental health, we have a Hopkinton Youth and Family Services Ambassador Program we'd like to start because it's impossible for us to do it all like with one and three quarter staff, it'd be wonderful to have other community members um, journey with us around mental health and spread the word about what we offer and um, how we can help. Um, so a lot, a lot going into this next year is really about publicizing the resources that are available, how our department works and how people can get help through here, including the interface referral service that um, was funded by the town last year after um, earmark funding the year before. Um, that has, oh, metrics that way. Um, over 143 people made a, made a connection to a clinician through that service um, from the town in 15 months. And um, nine of those people referenced suicidal ideation um, when they were making that, that connection point. Um, the leading issues were anxiety and depression. So um, we definitely wanna ramp up um, the um, knowledge and the information around um, the interface program so that um, every parent knows it exists. Um, it, it's been great. I was talking on the phone uh, with someone right before this call who said, yes, I just found out about interface today when I found out about your office because somebody used it and it was so helpful to them. And so, you know, those things, you know, give us give us the energy to keep going, right? That that we know that it's it's reaching people, but it could reach far more. I have I have the sneaking suspicion it could reach far more, and in partnering with local con clinicians um, and making sure that referrals are going their way, that people are utilizing their insurance benefit and and getting the help they need. Um, and reducing stigma around that. There's a lot of fears around those things. And so trying to do real informative work over this next year to reduce that stigma um, and that fear of receiving help. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's that's very thoughtful and your heart and minds are on the right track. And it's about, you know, some of the extreme scenarios and cases that you mentioned, but it's also about given the COVID, just I think people are minus uh, from normalcy for, you know, just the reality reality that we have around. And, uh, you know, staying uh, home for kids for a year is not normal. It's below normal as it is, right? So just to bring that up to level, I think needs a community support, school support, and expertise from your areas uh, overall uh, with thinking and action. So glad to hear uh, your thoughts around that. Now on the finance side, I think um, one thing I was wondering from the various COVID related state and federal aids that are out there. Uh, is there anything that you or our town could tap into for any of the programs or the strategic thinking and especially the COVID related situation uh, support uh, that you could tap into? And if there are any effort or anything that's going on uh, or you, are, um, you think we can pursue? So um, the risk with the COVID support um, is that it's, it goes away, right? So that, and, and what, what we know and what the data tells us is that we need somebody more permanent. Um, and then with grant funding, some of the grants that, that we've looked at and gone for, so um, we didn't just strategic plan. As needs came up, I got on them. I can tell you that I've been grant writing and, and some pan out and some don't. 
Some take a look at this community and judge it on its surface and think, well, it's a, one of those well-to-do towns, but they don't understand the tax burden on the residents. And so, um, you know, some of them, some of them fly through, some of them, you know, some of them don't. Um, but we've applied for some big ones to try to offset what we're asking for. Um, and, and certainly that would be the dream, but they won't come through until like, sep we won't know until September. We won't know until October. Um, and then um, when we looked at our staffing, there were needs far beyond one staff person. And, and so we're writing grants for those. Um, and so the Drug-Free Communities Grant would provide a prevention staff person, which many, many towns have now. And, and they see amazing reduction in youth substance use in communities and in adult substance use over time. And so, um, and, and we know that the community culture in this area and Metro West, um, there are things missing around youth substance use. Parents perceive that kids are doing far more of it than, than they are. And in Hopkinton, parents perceive that more kids, like 60% of our parents believed that kids are drinking, that all kids are drinking, you know, and, if, and, and, and that's not accurate at all. And so, um, you know, but where parents perceive that they are, they loosen their own, their their own, their their line comes down like as far as what they're gonna allow their kids to do. They allow them to do more things because they think all kids are doing them. Whereas, um, you know, those things aren't true. So we know, we know there's work to be done in that area as well. There's just a lot. <laughs> so, so we are pursuing grant funding earmarks. We're not hearing anything on that front right now, I think everything's being poured into COVID relief. Um, and then again, earmark funding is fickle. It comes with six months to spend it. And sometimes it's too much to spend in that, that short window. Um, and, and other times you know, we've used every dime. It just really depends on the earmark itself, what they, what they allow us to spend it on and whether or not it surfaces, so. Thank you. Understand. I'm glad you're uh, pursuing all those. And the last question I have is, uh, uh, this is something definitely, you know, um, from the town level, from your level, we appreciate all the effort, but would not would never be enough, right? Um, from just from the town administration perspective. So are you pursuing any partnership or any other collaborative effort with, uh, you know, nonprofit or any other agencies or any other um, healthcare or um, educational institute level? So not, not partnerships where we'd be paying for their service, um, but we routinely partner with other organizations. Some of them come and rely on us. They need us to fill out their applications for, you know, like I know the senior center uh, ends up doing the fuel assistance applications for smock because they get thousands that they can't handle themselves and on a community level we can connect people to those things so in many ways um that's the case but we partner with salvation army so that people can get their utility bills paid we partner with saint vincent de paul's for people's needs with the emerging emergency fund in town um, that will be helping um you know with families needs um, because the whole other side of what we do is that needs-based assistance. So it's not just clinical services, it's needs-based assistance and connecting people to the programs and services that help them. So in that way, again, like every week we're on the phone with all these different services partnering. We partner with the senior center to serve people. We partner with the police department and fire department. Um, you know, like we are a team and with the health department. And the health department has done some neat things around youth vaping and, and we utilize those programs when it's not COVID. Um, so, you know, we, we have um, done those things in terms of, and we have looked at what it would mean to contract, you know, to bring in a clinician or something, but we wouldn't get as much out of them, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and with the rapid turnover in these agencies, that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, we take yeah. interns, we take no. interns, and that's a source of, of um, help for us. But when they leave, they leave caseloads behind, caseloads of kids that come back on us again. And so, and, and students take quite a bit of, of effort and time. And so it's always that balance. 
No, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I was more referring, uh, I think, expanding your service and providing the service with partnership, that's, uh, I, I think, very noble. And as much as you are stretching out, I was thinking of the other way as well, that if a hospital has, you know, some pro bono service or some uh, non-profit service that your um, team can tap into and get some help from them uh, as a financial aid or as a service, a clinician from them come and help you and provide extra hands. Uh, some of the hospitals do that. So just to put it on your radar. They do. They have funds um, that they keep, but their grant funds are, are pretty limited and go like I used to sit on some of those boards before coming to this town and, and their funds are limited and, and they're very competitive. And so, um, you know, I think we tried to tap them for help with interface and there was there was no money to be had there. It really depends on the hospital networks and who's in your area and what they're already serving in communities. And so um, we've looked in that direction before. Um, but sure. yes, you know. Yeah. Like, no, I understand. Yeah, thank you again for all the services and good work. It, it's it's a challenging work and challenging space, certainly. Thank you. Thanks, Shahadul. Yeah, um, the one thing I want to bring up, um, I just want to say, uh, Kudos to you, Don, and that because uh, we've been following the family services probably well since I've been on the board for seven, eight years, and uh, the direction you're taking it in is definitely in the right direction. Before it was just you were offering, not you, but previously it was offering clinical services right in the town hall. And now the way you do work with the partnerships and everything is definitely the right direction. I think, and you're you're reaching more people, and it's more effective that way. And, and definitely kudos to the direction you're taking it in. But that's uh, that's all I have. Um, anything else? All right. Thank you, Don. Okay. Thank you. And I'll I'll drop if there's ability to put stuff in chat. I don't see a chat here, so maybe not. But um, Chris, if I send it out to you, can you get it to them? I was just going to say that. Yeah. Great. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have a senior center. So, Tim, I take it before we, I know you have to leave in a few minutes. Sean's not here yet for. Uh, yes. I'm going to flash up Amy's budget for a minute, and then Ben will be able to refer to it. Sean is not here. We are trying to get through to him. If he doesn't show up tonight, we will add him to next week. Okay. I just wanted to make, I know you're leaving soon. Right. So, I just wanted to bring that out. Okay. Thank you. So, I, now we can start with the. Uh, uh, senior center departments. Great. Well, a couple tough acts to follow there, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, so I just want to start with the mission of the senior center because I think it's important to know as we go into this, um, it's to enhance and enrich the quality of life for adults age 60 and older in the town of Hockington by providing activities and services that encourage independence, healthy living, and continued participation in the community. And as you can imagine, this year has made it really interesting. Um, we've had to switch all of what we do to a more virtual platform in, in what we do with um, our seniors. And that's been um, a lot of pluses, um, but it also has brought a lot of other things to it. Um, but as far as looking at our budget, we have worked really hard this past year to continue to offer the same services and programs that we did prior to COVID. Um, we've just had to use a different format. So our budget stays relatively the same. Um, as you can see, um, or he had it up. Um, but as far as the personal services, this budget reflects the current staffing levels of nine office and transportation staff and a five kitchen staff. Um, these levels are necessary to ensure that all our programs are that we currently provide um, are continuing. Um, I think some people have recognized that online uh, programs are not easier than in-person programs and they do require a lot more effort on the staffing. And so we are keeping those at the same levels. Um, and we're, we're always currently, and, and we're currently, and we're always looking um, and evaluating our staffing plan to make sure we have the proper funding sources for everything. Uh, looking also at our expenses, again, we do utilize grants and the support of our friends group to continue to expand our program needs. Um, but we're always, we're pretty careful about how we spend the money. Uh, we've been able to continue everything 
that we've done in the past um, funding wise um, so and program wise but we are pretty careful you know as a side note um, seniors constitute the age of 60 up to 100 or more and so you can imagine that the needs in that range are varied and um, require a lot of different types of services and assistance but I do believe that this budget reflects that. Uh, let's see. I don't know if anyone has any other current questions, but again, we have just continued to do what we've been doing before, just in a new way. So just your budget is down 5%? Yeah, I, we're, we're constantly evaluating the staffing plan. Um, we've had grant funded programs or uh, personnel that we are um, looking to make sure it's in the right spot. Okay, I guess I, that, I like that, but from a finance perspective, but just, just making sure I understand why. But, all right, uh, any questions, uh, Bill? Uh, I can go with a couple, um, and thank you again. I think this is, I mean, from a finance perspective, it certainly uh, looks uh, good that you have. I, I just wanted to check, is there any service levels that you think um, uh, may be impacted or uh, maybe, you know, having any risk in future uh, and you, you may need to adjust later on? I think one of the things that we're working with right now is um, technology. Uh, we have seniors who are extremely adept uh, could put us a lot of us to shame. Um, and then we have others where technology is a four letter word and it's not something that either they have an interest in or can manage. Um, so that's a balance that we're constantly working with. We have thought about whether it's appropriate to um, provide some technology to people, but it's also can be a lot more confusing and frustrating and um, I guess frustrating is the best word to those who, who just can't manipulate it or can't seem to manage it. Um, and that's not something we wanna do. Um, if those are in need, if people are in need of technology, we've certainly thought and looked at grants that might help us go after that. We do use our friends group who would be very supportive of anything we wanted to do as far as that's concerned if we did try to bring technology to those that, that may want it. Currently, we really haven't had a lot of takers on that. But we have hit quite a few people with the virtual programs that we are currently doing. Uh, I have to say that most, almost every single one of the, um, bar maybe one or two of the exercise programs that we currently offer, we were doing before. Um, we really haven't dropped what we're doing. We've just had to find a new way. Our outreach is also very busy, like Don said, and we constantly are working with other departments to make sure that seniors have what they need to continue to live in their own homes, that they all have the resources that they need, um, whether it's financial to help with bills or whether make sure that they have their food, that they have all of that. We, we did switch one of our programs, which was in-house, which was our nutrition program. We were offering meals five days a week um, other than a short six week hiatus, once we shut down, <laughs> closed the doors to having people come in person, about six weeks later, we opened back up using the health department's recommendations and, and everything that was put out there to safely bring meals four days a week um, to about the same amount of seniors. Uh, we started off at 40 seniors, uh, moved it up to 50 a day, uh, but we're doing it four days a week instead of five. The nice thing about that is we are also bringing meals to people. About half of those meals each day are delivered to someone's doorstep. So no one is going without if we can help it. That's great, that's great, thank you. And on that note, I, I also just wanted to understand um, for my kind of uh, education to some extent is, do you have any uh, plan to expand or add any new services uh, post COVID or just in general um, plan over the next year or next few years. And one thing I always feel is that uh, it's the 
elderly community, um, especially who uh, most likely doesn't have uh, school going children, uh, takes the brunt of the tax load, uh, but probably doesn't get the benefit of the schools like uh, younger uh, families do. And <laughs> from that perspective, I think it's befitting to you know look for services and how um, there might be other potential uh, newer and creative ways to serve that community through your wonderful organization. So uh, I just wanted to understand and hear what are your thoughts and if anything that you see are potential opportunities in that room. So this spring, um, we're gonna be starting our strategic planning, that's a word, strategic planning process. And so we're hoping to be able to look and see what else may be needed. I will say that one of the programs that we had to shut down is we had a volunteer driver program for medical rides, um, but we did receive a grant recently so that we're partnering with local taxis that were able to provide that service um, at some point. Um, but I, I think what's, you know, we are always looking at it. And because Hopkinton's demographic, tem demographics are constantly changing, we're constantly looking at what more we can do. Um, I, I have to say, I'm hoping a lot will come up in the strategic plan that shows us what we can do, but we have always been partnering in the last several years in particular with as many community groups as possible. Um, and any idea that comes up, we try to run with and see where we think the interest is. It's funny because when you look at the other surrounding towns and the senior centers and what they're doing, uh, things that might work in Ashland or Southboro or Westboro, we've had no interest. And yet other things that we have flying off the shelves activity and involvement here isn't working in another town. So it's a very interesting, I think it's just really interesting to see how it changes town to town, um, but we're, we're always looking to expand. Um, and again, you know, for us right now, because technology for some is limited, it makes it a little bit more difficult. I know our big focus right now is how do we emerge gently back into having people into our building? And that is, I think our focus at the moment, you know, how can we bring things back? Um, and we, we do offer a wide variety. So do I have any set plan? I can't say that there's anything else that I can think of off the top of my head that's definitely have to have, but we are looking to improve the current things. Um, one of the, like I said, the strategic, the strategic plan, but also looking at our nutrition program and making sure that we are really up to date. I don't want anyone to go without as far as um, you know, food insecurity. Did that answer the question or did I miss something there? No, it did. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, it's a work in progress, of course, and you have all the you know, good thoughts around those. So thank you again for uh, you and your organization uh, for the wonderful service. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Abdul. <clears throat> Bill, do you have any questions? Yeah, just a couple. Um, hi, Amy, good to see, uh, see you again, again. Um, kind of a follow-up on that, pre-COVID, and this may not be a fair question until you do your strategic planning, but pre-COVID, knowing you take from 60 and above, was there an age bracket where most people fit in that were taking advantage of services at the location? And, and well, I'll stop there to see if you have an answer for that. Yeah, I, I wanna say, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, I think every senior center around the country is, is asking themselves this, this kind of question. We find that I think most of the people we hit are 70 and above. Uh, the 60 to 70 crowd are still working, a lot of them. And so, and uh, <laughs> I always have to laugh. A lot of people in that group have parents who are still attending the senior center, so they don't see themselves as seniors yet. Um, so. We, we see some, but not so many in that age group. Um, and, and also why do they wanna go where their parents are going? <laughs> and so I think, you know, that's probably, but, but we have been focusing on that more and more and we're constantly trying to come up with ways to 
at least let no, that age group know that we're here. Um, we're here to help them when they need it. We're here to help them when they're dealing with their parents. We're here when they want us and we have a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, we range from, you know, some lower impact exercise classes to a pound class, which is a much more rock band oriented type of activity. Um, so we're, we're trying to make sure we hit that whole range and we've started prior to COVID, we had that as an evening class. So we weren't, we normally, our normal day would end at four, but on one night a week, we would expand to seven and throw some things that might be of more interest to that younger senior crowd that they could go to on their way home from work. Um, and I have to say, you know, it, it is hard to, to do that now during COVID, um, but that is a focus that we, we are looking for in the future. Well, I think where I was going with it, you mentioned you're going to be easing back into things as, as, as the situation improves. And I'm just curious, when you think about those services that you are providing to most people, do you foresee any issues ramping back up to speed? And the follow-up to that is with the demographics that we have in this town, do you see any capacity constraints in the next three to five years? So first on the immediate and then a little bit more midterm based so, on the demographics. So immediately, I think, you know, our biggest question is how do we ramp that up? Um, so we're looking at virtual programs now. I think we're trying to figure out how can we, you know, as, as some people are comfortable moving back into the senior center, how do we combine those that may still not be? So we, our programming might be uh, virtual, it could be in person, it could be a combination of that. And I think we're trying to figure out how we're gonna to, if we can do all of that so that we do reach those who are comfortable and those who still may not be. Um, capacity wise, for the future, I think because we had prior to COVID trying to partner with Parks and Rec and had a partnership going that we were ready to roll out with um, Pickleball, um, that was something that was put on hold with COVID. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is utilize the resources in, in town that might be something that we can do. We could not do pickleball here. We don't have the room. We don't have the, um, the ceiling height that would promote something like that. Um, but we are looking towards the community and maybe there are things that we can take advantage of within it. Um, and like I said, that's just one small thing that we had been looking at, unfortunately that's on hold at the moment, so. Okay, my, my last question, again, thank you for everything you're doing there, is what outside service do you offer? Do you have the most need for help right now and maybe anticipate it being a greater need once people feel more comfortable in accessing your outside services? So whether it's delivering meals or I'm not sure what else you do other than that outside of the building. Um. Most of it is done inside the building. I think transportation is our biggest one. We do have our own buses. One's a lease bus, one's a town owned bus that obviously I'd love to bring back for um, trips and all of that. Right now, obviously not. Um, but we are working with the MWRTA to expand their service in town. Um, and we're hoping over the next, I'll say six months, hopefully less to expand some of that as well. And with grant opportunities, we've been able to do a lot more with that. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest outside service. I know that we do have people like Don had spoken to that we are constantly trying to make sure that they, you know, things have changed financially for them or they may need assistance. We have a great network within town um, that we are calling on when needed to help those. Um, Project Just Because has been amazing. Um, the uh, Knights of Columbus have been amazing also in their assistance. And I know that there's another community fund that that's being worked on right now to help with that. I'd say funding sources sometimes when people are at that point where they just need that financial assistance. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Bill. Wayne, do you have any questions? Uh, Bill, actually, you, you, you covered the question I was going to ask on kind of anticipated capacity. So I'm all set. Thank you. You know, my biggest message I think that I want to get out there is, you know, schools are great. I love that Hopkinton has great schools, but you know, 
we want to retire. We want people to feel that they can retire in Hopkinton, and we're doing everything we can to keep that attainable for people. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amy. So, Ben, you're now uh, in charge, right? So, uh, we don't have any representation from uh, uh, health services, correct? So uh, that we're gonna have to reschedule? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, we weren't able to get in touch with Sean, so we will uh, schedule him for the, the next meeting. Um, so appreciate your patience and I'm happy to MC the rest of the, the rest of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think we're done with the, the portion of uh, uh, discussing with the various departments. Um, so I don't think you have to stick around anymore. I guess we're gonna review questions from previous budget sessions, or I don't know if there's anything we wanted to go over today. Has anything changed since last week? So through you, Mr. Chair, we, we did not uh, have any outstanding questions to respond to at this meeting, but I guess I would also open the floor to see if there's anything that anyone on the committee would like us to uh, respond to um, that you've heard tonight or, or previously uh, for next week's meeting. I guess I would like to know where is the select board with the budget? I haven't gotten a lot of feedback. They haven't uh, approved it yet or passed it to appropriation. Uh, that's correct, uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the select board has uh, finished their review this past Tuesday of all their meetings with the department heads. And we anticipate it will go to a vote um, this coming Tuesday at their next meeting um, to pass to the appropriation committee. Any indication? Any indication, are they going to vote which budget they want? Or because uh, I know they had, was it was at a 1% and a 2.5%, and or are they going to just pass the whole thing? And, and we, so, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I would not presume to <laughs> uh, anticipate what the select board will or won't do. All I can say uh, is from what I've heard during the meetings, is there seems to be general support of the 2.5% budget and, and not as much discussion about the 1%. But again, I, I would not. Um, uh, presume to, to know what, what their decision will be. Okay. Anybody have any questions, budget questions? Um, just generally speaking, um, the strategic planning session that we uh, observed yesterday, does that have any or direct budget implications? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe the answer to that question is no for the FY22 budget. Uh, what will be happening is we'll be sending out an electronic fillable survey um, and we've broken out into between two categories. One being what is included in the FY22 budget request for folks to rank and then what is uh, to be requested in the future potentially um, to rank. And we'll, we'll use that information to um, evaluate what the community priorities are, but we do not anticipate um, last night's meeting to adjust the fiscal 22 budget um, as we understand things today. Thank you, Ben. And follow up, um, the items that we heard yesterday, those are, I assume, in addition to the items that we already have been discussing say for the last couple of years. And remember with team and your help, uh, we had lined up some capital uh, budget asks potentially over the next few years, or, or having said that, maybe there's some overlap. Just wanted to clarify that. Uh, yes, through, through Mr. Chair, I would say there is some some overlap there. Um, the the big Id capital items you heard about last night would be uh, center school, the public safety facility, and, and the new school building. Um, there will be also some routine um, capital requests in the coming years that weren't included in, in that um, meeting yesterday, uh, but more geared towards maintaining the capital um, assets that we have in town today, um, just to ensure you know, they're, they're properly cared for. Thank you. And, you know, I think at some point we'd like to see that lined up uh, once things kind of brew further or mature further. So we have a perspective in the future that we have been keeping an eye on, but obviously it changes for good reasons and rightfully so. so. Something to keep on our radar in the future. Very good, thank you. Yeah, I know everybody from the appropriation was 
attended that uh, session last night. And I was actually a little bit confused because they kept on referring to the spreadsheet to fill out and you pick your priorities. And I got a table with a bunch of different projects and I didn't know if they were referring to the same thing and what, is that what we're probably, it was confusing what we, because he kept on talking about what we're going to put, he wanted people to re reply with the priorities. And I was just confused on what exactly they were referring to him. Ben, I don't know if you know the answer to that. But yeah. Yeah. I was definitely, I go, uh, what they said, the, the handout that Josh gave, but I go, am I, am I a little too black and white about what a table is and what a spreadsheet is? And, and if it was, that's what they were referring to. So it kind of, kind of lost me on, on what we were supposed to submit. But I think when you said there's going to be a, a survey coming out, that that's what he was talking about. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, I, I think this really uh, encapsulates the, the, the phrase experiment that Norman used earlier, um, that uh, within the next 24 hours, we anticipate we'll, you'll get a, a fillable uh, either survey monkey or uh, fillable Google form um, to, to rank in a, in a more clear way. No, no, I feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that. And uh, yeah, just generally, I think it was a um, very good session. And uh, I, I have to say this, I read the um, you know, instructions and that's why some of the questions we were doing, I asked to Mike and thanks Mike for posing those. But it did feel like that you know, the appropriations committee was um, taking a back seat and almost like a second tier citizenship <laughs> in that conversation, which I thought was a little surprising because when you have strategic planning, budget and appropriations goes hand in hand, if not in the middle of that. So just my comment and observation on that. So yeah, I, I agreed. And actually it was just supposed to be for the chairs and uh, people who are, are, are elected officials. And so I kind of pushed back saying, I, I think there needs to be a little more than just the chair. And so Norman agreed, but because there, he thought that there would be so many people asking questions. He said that all questions go through one person, which made it a little more difficult. If there was a, if you could have a chat window and there was a private chat and you can ask me the questions, it would have been much easier than uh, Shahdul sent me a text on on my cell phone to, to ask a question. So that was a no. <laughs> fully- <laughs> Thank uh, you, Mike. And, and a good analogy would be, we all work in corporate world, right? I mean, it's like, let's do a strategic planning. By the way, the finance department is not invited. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was, it was actually easier if you were not on the panel to ask a question because there they could post the questions through chat and they got answered. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's another two. I couldn't find a chat to put anything in, but interesting uh, observation, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Here. Yeah. Do we have anything else to discuss? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I would just say the, the next item on there is the review of changes to estimated revenue or expenses. We have no firm updates for you tonight. I would just um, just point you to the news where um, the uh, proposed uh, $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus package seems to be moving through uh, House and Senate. Uh, it's too early to tell exactly what could potentially be allocated to a community like Hopkinton, but I would just say that Early signs indicate about uh, two point, uh, about double uh, the amount that's been allocated to city and towns and the CARES Act is proposed in the, uh, the stimulus plan here. Uh, and signs indicate that the funding is likely to be more flexible than it was in the CARES Act. You may remember with the CARES Act, it had to be unbudgeted through a certain time frame and a direct response to COVID-19. Um, it's, it's too early to, to give firm um, guidance on that yet from the federal government or the state, but signs point to a more flexible um, funding source in this round of stimulus. So I would say potentially good news. What are, what, so we were budgeting about a million? You said it's double? Uh, so it, through the CARES Act, through Mr. Chair, we got $1.6 million allocated to us uh, and the schools were allocated 171 specifically by the state. Um, the, the funding um, in this package to cities and towns is, uh, two times that, what was that allocated in the CARES Act. So we don't know ultimately what will be allocated to us as a subrecipient of the state, but um, again, good good indications at the federal level. Okay, good news. 
Thank now, you. is there any preconditions or specific, uh, I would think, and that's normal, um, attached to it? Uh, through you, Mr. Yee, there certainly will be. Um, we don't know to the extent that, that those, uh, those restrictions will exist and, and more information will come as, as the bill passes through the legislature. Like, will they allow because everyone's fleeing the cities, moving to the suburbs and the schools are growing and therefore it's uh, unlimited use for school growth? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's, that should be <laughs> perhaps coming up. Okay. I just have one quick item through the chair. Um, Wayne Connor had asked me to reach out to you about um, submitting your application again for the committee now that your term had expired. He said he had sent you an email about that. Yes, I did intend to do that. Sorry. It's no problem. I just promised him I would remind yeah. you, and also, and also Todd. I don't know if anyone is in touch with Todd. He has to do the same. I can send him an email. I tried to call you, Wayne, a couple of times. Or uh... <laughs> you did I was de I was I met that week I was dealing with parents. Parent, sorry, it was a uh, it was it was it was a messy week, but all's good now. I will take care of that. So I got a that came from Connor Connor Deegan, the town clerk. I think all you have to do is you go to the hop. The Hopkinton uh, uh, website, and I think you just reapply through there. Okay. So that'll be recognized. Cool. And that was a good point last night, and I, I kind of uh, agreed about the the website. I guess Josh Josh isn't isn't in this meeting, but uh, definitely it's it's not intuitive to go through the Hop uh, the town website because every every week I'm like, oh, is it recycling week, and I have to try and find the mm -hmm. The calendar with the re is it recycling week and that should be like one click as soon as you come up it's some it's buried down in, in dpw someplace so <laughs> although i guess everyone has their priorities but uh, i think the state has a has it good you know where they they know it's you're either calling for uh, covid covid information or uh, uh the d the rmv and to get a your 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 something renewed and it's right in the front. Click click the RMV. So that just makes it really easy instead of having to really go through the site. But <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Uh, so that's review changes of estimated revenue or expenses. Um, do we intend to uh, review the the committee report, the appropriation committee report? Is there anything new to report there? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no updates to share with the committee yet. We're uh, working on compiling a report, but do not yet have a draft um, to share with you this evening, uh, but would also welcome any any thoughts on, on something you would like to see in the report um, that hasn't been or, or you'd like to see uh, in fiscal for fiscal 2022. Okay, I definitely liked what we had last year. Uh, I think if we see it, I don't know if there's just things related to the pandemic that would be more would provide some information or how, how we're changing but I I would have to see you know uh, what the budget is and, and compared to last year if there's just something that's like a, a gap that we now have that we need some more information but I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now if I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts Okay, yeah, thanks. And I, I would just uh, say uh, uh, having COVID-19 information in there, I think is a great suggestion. And we will definitely think about that as, as we start to draft the, um, do the draft. So thank you. Maybe in the terms of, especially if we do get funding, what is one-time one -time revenue or something? Or, or also what are one-time expenses? Hopefully when we're through this, do the expenses go away? I mean, it's, uh, the big, the big thing coming up is, I think the structural, is it the structural deficit or whatever that we're kind of, in, in how we can, what is it going to take to get out of it, or where we are? That that's my biggest concern still, and uh, um, maybe there's something we need to chart, graph, or something related to that, and what's pandemic related, what's not. Uh, what are the guidelines for appropriation and? The limitations of those. Of, I'm sorry, of what, Shahidul? No, I was um, adding that I uh, would like to know what are the guidelines and conditions for appropriating the COVID-related uh, funding 
and uh, what are the limitations. So we have a full picture of that. You mean funding from the state or the right, from, federal? Right, from the state okay. and federal combined, yeah. Yeah, I think a okay. clear understanding would help us as we discuss those and going through that. Very good. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, and, and then through you, Mr. Chair, just one last point. Um, the next week, you'll hear from finance, HR, land use, town clerk, and elections, and the IT department at our, our next Thursday meeting. Okay. And also on that, Mr. Chair, um, I did, we, we were contacted by a resident that will most likely want to speak in the public forum, just as an FYI. Um, I believe it was involving the Mass Mutual land that you wanted to speak about. So I'm, gonna I'm sorry, the I'm sorry, the what? The Mass, uh, no, sorry, not Mass Mutual, Liberty Mutual uh, property. I think she'll be calling in. I haven't seen the, haven't seen the warrant where all the, Articles, is there something regarding the Liberty Mutual property? I don't, I don't even know off my head, to be honest. Wasn't there something for you last back? year that everything was everything was tabled? Wasn't there one? Uh, it, it, sorry. I think it did come up at town meeting in September. Um, whether it was, was it tabled or was it? I can't remember because I remember there was a discussion. Um, was it that it was tabled the warrant article or that there was no sense in it wasn't going to help or did it get turned down? I can't, this is my memory. I can't recall because I don't think we had a say in it. It wasn't really, there was nothing financial at that time. Uh, yeah, th through you, Mr. Chair, the, the kind of bo both are true. Uh, there were in that general discussion about the solar, there was talk about a solar overlay map um, and that was tabled. Um, also, in the Liberty Mutual property, um, the town authorized the select board to negotiate um, a potential purchase price, uh, though there was no money appropriated at a town meeting. Um, the, there was a citizen's uh, submission to the CPC um, to use open space um, funding resources out of the CPC to um, fund uh, a potential purchase of that land. The CPC uh, review is ongoing. Um, with, with any pot potential um, purchase price. So if, if something will go to town meeting um, by the CPC's recommendation, it would certainly come to you um, when they come to speak to you at a future meeting. Okay. It almost seems like, well, I'm not gonna, can't say what the public should or should not do. We have no information until it gets proposed to us through, so we can listen, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, okay. All right, thank you, Chris, for that information. Sure. Uh, anything else? I just have uh, a suggestion, Mike, and for Chris, Ben, we've been wonderful in helping with the meeting and the aids. One is uh, if you can put the link for the meeting on the body of the uh, meeting invite, I think uh, today's response from 75% of the <laughs> committee members shows that we are struggling with that. That would be, I think, logistically helpful, even though it's it's trivial, of course. I think it was my, I think I figured it out last, I think I had it last week, but uh, I think this week, because I, 10 minutes before the meeting, I wanted to join, I'm like, where is it? And then realized on my computer, I work for Dell and we're not Google friendly. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll put it in like 25 <laughs> so, so, so I couldn't find it. So, and I think last time I had to email it from another source because I couldn't access, uh, Agenda. Yeah, I'm just used to seeing it on the body, so I it didn't dawn to me <laughs> to open up some some other document. But just that, uh, and uh, related to the um, Liberty Mutual, if we can uh, have some pertinent information, you probably already have it from town meetings and others uh, that would help us um, participate in that context uh, with the questions that uh, a town resident may have. Okay. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it would be questions, but I think it's their opinion, right? We're not. It's yeah. not a public here. We're not. We don't have a public hearing yet to answer questions on it. But they're allowed. Anyone's allowed. Oh, to okay. Right. Yeah. 
uh, to understand them, <laughs> I think. All right. I think we're all set. Any, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. A second. Okay. okay uh, I have to do a one at a time. Uh, do we hear a motion to adjourn, Bill? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Shahadul? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Okay, four, four zero, we can adjourn. I, I forgot to do that last time, then I saw heard Brendan do it last last night. So I'm like, oh <laughs> I guess I, we can't just do a yay or nay for everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Chris. And uh, everybody have a good evening. Talk Thank to you next all. week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good evening.